This video is sponsored by Blinkist. We seem to be some part of the punchline to a cruel joke. To consciously navigate this existence with the desire for safety, triumph, calmness, and certainty hardwired into us, all while being stricken to a chaotic world, fragile body, and mysterious, fluctuating, indifferent universe. There are, has been, and will continue to forever be things to worry about as long as this dichotomy exists, which will likely be as long as human is human. There is no shortage of reasons to worry, and there is no shortage of causes for assuming those reasons, even when one does not have to, at least not yet. How absurd it would be to not, at least some of the time, feel worried by the absurdity of everything. But of course, after a point, worrying about the future and the unknown and the potential of things going wrong is nothing but a useless handicap. We mostly all know that over-worrying can sometimes be just as much of a problem as not worrying at all. But this balance, like most balances, is complex. How much concern for the future is enough, and how much is not? And how does one find out and reconcile this balance without worsening the whole problem? One philosophy in particular that focuses a good portion of its attention on addressing the problem of worry is the philosophy of Stoicism, an enduring, nearly universal school of philosophy originally founded in ancient Greece and then further popularized in ancient Rome. Generally, a key principle of Stoicism is understanding that the only thing we can truly control in life is our internal domain, our interpretations, reactions, and personal decisions. And everything else, the external reactions to our actions, other people, and the happenings of the world and universe at large are things we cannot. This is worth noting because regarding the issue of worrying, Stoicism suggests that one should try to maintain the following balance an awareness that the things we are worried about could and very likely might happen, that life will contain moments of tragedy and sharp turns, and that we should be prepared for these moments both mentally and practically in any way we can. However, equally important is recognizing that many of these sorts of catastrophic moments can't be known nor controlled nor predicted, and thus, after a point, worrying has none. Once one has done everything that is rationally and realistically preventative, they should work to revert their attention back to the present, leaving all additional concern about the future for the future. Awareness and rational preparation have value to the future at low cost to the present, but worrying about what one cannot know nor control of the future has no value to either and comes at the cost of the present. Following the Stoic way of thinking, to potentially help counter this unnecessary anxiety and bring our attention and enjoyment back to the present, we can remind ourselves that, in the future, things might not be okay, but if they might not be, then they are now, or at least better than the future versions we are worried about. If we are worried that things will only get worse, then things are as good as they'll ever be right now. And how foolish it would be to ruin what might be okay now out of concern of things potentially not being so later, if one cannot know nor do anything further to prevent it. And better yet, if one is wrong about what they're fearful of, then things will only get better, and there's even less reason to worry. Moreover, we tend to assume the worst. We tend to worry not only about things going wrong, but the worst cases of things going wrong, paired with the sense that in the face of such cases, we would be broken and ruined beyond repair. However, how often is this actually true? Stoic philosopher Seneca wrote, We are more often frightened than hurt, and we suffer more from imagination than from reality. Epictetus similarly wrote, Man is not worried by real problems so much as by his imagined anxieties about real problems. In all likeliness, there is someone somewhere right now living some version of a seemingly worst case scenario for many of us, living with no phone, computer, TV, and a great many other things, unaware of this video and perhaps a huge portion of the happenings of the world. And he or she is likely just as happy or unhappy as many of us right now. We are adaptable creatures, wired to adjust our worries to our circumstances as well as our abilities to remain okay in the face of them and it is perhaps of great use to consider and meditate on this idea frequently and with confidence, that even if it went some version of nearly worst case, we would likely still be some form of okay. The ingredients of your being that have gotten you where you are, that have given you what you've experienced, will still remain. To paraphrase Roman statesman and philosopher Cicero, while one still breathes, one still has hope, at least in some form. In no way is this to make light of the torment of enduring and recovering from hardships in life. 
there is a spectrum of human horrors, some far worse and more trying than others. In some cases, it is entirely improbable to recover in the true sense of the term. But even if this is true, and one is worried about these sorts of unrecoverable things happening, then again, they haven't happened yet. In truth, how many things have we been worried about in the past that haven't crossed our minds since, individually and collectively? And what have we never worried about before that we are unfathomably worried about right now? How often has time erected or eroded our worries in new but equal form? How often has the world ended but hasn't? How often has everything collapsed but hasn't? How often has everything gone worst case but hasn't? This does not mean that the latter two never have nor don't or that the former couldn't, but proportionally, it's rarely worth the bet. French Renaissance philosopher and writer Michel de Montaigne wrote, My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened. Arguably, many of us know all of this, at least in some form or another. In general, we likely have or could logically conclude that worrying about what hasn't happened or what we can't do anything about only adds or creates unnecessary suffering. But yet, most of us keep worrying. Like with most difficult things, there are paradoxes and ironies found in trying to implement these sorts of simple seeming ideas of resolution. To try to resolve one's excessive worrying requires one being worried about their worrying, at least to an extent. One can't use worry against worry to eliminate it. And so, realistically, despite the Stoic ideas being so obvious and perhaps simple, in practice, we will perhaps always remain trapped in some amount of unnecessary worry, inextricably linked with the human condition. And consequently, perhaps our goal should be reducing unnecessary worry rather than removing it entirely. And perhaps by accepting this, that one will always feel unease, and that it is a natural part of the tragic backstory of human life, paradoxically, one might worry a little less about worrying as a whole. If we shouldn't distress over what we can't change or control outside of ourselves, perhaps at a point, we shouldn't distress about what we can't control inside of ourselves either. Of course, all we can do is try our best and try our best to not worry about whether or not our best resolves the impossible. Because in truth, there is likely no heroic ultimate defeat of worry, only small mini victories moment to moment along the way. Ultimately, we are not special in our sufferings nor in our overcoming of them, individually and collectively. Human history is carved through trenches. We dip in and out of oscillating hardships, founded or unfounded. We are plagued by plagues and hatred and conflict and mortal fragility. But if we are fortunate enough to worry about something that is potentially not survivable happening to us, as opposed to trying to survive something that already has, it is perhaps worth trying to be okay while we still are. This video was sponsored by Blinkist. With Time's foot constantly on the gas, Blinkist makes it easy to navigate and learn from the overwhelming amount of important nonfiction books more efficiently and conveniently. By condensing complete books down into overview summaries, Blinkist provides key information, ideas, and frameworks of books in around 15 minutes. If you're interested in philosophy, Blinkist has a great assortment including The Wisdom of Life by Arthur Schopenhauer, The Way of Zen by Alan Watts, several works of Stoicism, and much more. Perhaps most usefully, Blinkist can help you discover if a book or author is what you are looking for without necessarily having to read the full version first. Additionally, the overviews can provide helpful refreshers into books that you have already read, all in all making Blinkist a great complement for more comprehensive learning habits as well. All book overviews can be read or conveniently listened to within the Blinkist app. And for users who are interested in delving into full versions of books, Blinkist now also provides complete purchasable audiobooks within the app as well. The first 100 people to use the link in the description will receive one free week of unlimited access as well as 25% off a premium membership. The seven day trial is completely free and can be canceled at any time within the trial period. Again, if you're interested, you can visit Blinkist.com slash Pursuit of Wonder or click the link in the description. And of course, thank you so much for watching in general and see you next video.